From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief Radio. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Rev. Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch broadcasting this week from New York City. The legislature in Missouri seems obsessed with transgender persons this session in the form of six different bills bent on excluding, isolating, and erasing trans youth in that state. A tremendous outpouring of support for those impacted by this unconscionable attack is coming from diverse groups of Missourians, including faith leaders. But the momentum in the state and in the nation is powerful and profoundly dangerous. This week, we'll talk with Maharat Rory Pickernis, Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis and National LGBTQ Task Force Faith Work Director, Rev. Nicole Garcia. The uncompromising vision Christian nationalists and supporters have for our nation leaves out many of us, really most of us. Americans of the, quote, wrong faiths, never mind secular Americans, have no place in that vision. But that also means broad coalitions opposing Christian nationalism make a lot of sense. And what's needed is strong leadership and a more inclusive vision for this country. Sarah Levin is founder and principal of Secular Strategies and a co-chair on the Democratic National Committee's Interfaith Council. She'll be with us to raise up some of that inspired and growing opposition. You can hear State of Belief on the radio and get the podcast on Apple Podcasts and all other podcast platforms. Every week, I am in conversations with some of the most fascinating and impactful civic and religious leaders across the nation. Please subscribe today. State of Belief is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest, Maharat Rory Pickernis is Executive Director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of St. Louis, a rabbinic fellow at the David Hartman Center, and the loving mom of an 11-year-old son who identifies as transgender. The Reverend Nicole Garcia is Faith Work Director at the National LGBTQ Task Force and identifies as a queer transgender Latina. She is a licensed professional counselor in the state of Colorado. Maharat Rory and Reverend Nicole, thank you both so much for being with us here today. Thank you for having us. Yes, it's good to, good to be chatting with you again. Rory, I wonder if we can start with you to tell listeners a little bit about your own background as a Jewish leader, and then also about your son and how you come specifically to the issues of trans right in your own state. So as you introduced me, I use the title Maharat, which is not the most common of titles. Um, Essentially, I work as a rabbi trained through an organization called Yeshivat Maharat, which was started to specifically train Orthodox women for clergy positions in the Jewish community at a time when Orthodox communities was then not ordaining women as rabbis, although there has been significant shift within that. I had been working in a pulpit. Now um, I run the Jewish Community Relations Council, which means that it's my responsibility to build bridges between our Jewish community and other faith, ethnic, civic, and political groups. We work together on issues that are important to the Jewish community and important to the region at large. And so for me, my involvement in advocating for trans rights is both a personal and professional role. And this is something that we feel incredibly passionate about through the JCRC and as a Jewish community, but also as a mom. It's hard for me to fully describe what the process has been over the past four years of going into the state capitol in Missouri and needing to beg legislators to just see our family as a normal family to understand that 
My son is a child. He's now 11. He started testifying on these bills when he was eight years old. And at the core, it's really about just seeing him as a person, as a full person. We can keep unpacking all of the different pieces of it, but it, it has been... It's been emotional to say the least. It's been challenging. And it's been really interesting also to find the intersection where so many of the voices that we hear in opposition to the trans community, so many of the proponents of these anti-trans bills cite their faith traditions when they testify in support of these bills. Um, two of the bill sponsors in the Missouri State House are pastors themselves. All of the bill sponsors in the State House cite their church affiliation in their bios. And so we have been an active part, as I said, I've been doing this through my professional career. I've been doing this as a mom, but also as a faith leader, working to try to build this counter narrative of of faith voices who say, that's not what our faith tradition has to say. That's not the only version of this story that we have to tell. Mm, I think that is like, that. that is the crux of it. I mean, I, I think that the idea that there is one position for the faith community, I, 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 I want to go continue to go deeper with you, but I, I want to bring in Reverend Nicole here because this is very much also what you are passionate about and so helpful for many of uh, our broader community to help understand that the faith community actually has a really can and must offer a counter narrative here. And we're really starting from um, the saying behind the eight ball. We have to recognize that the Roman Catholic Church has their own TV program, EWTN. My mother used to watch it all the time. The evangelicals have had um, all these revivals on TV for decades. They know how to use that program. They, they've known how to use broadcast TV for years, and that's how they build their following. I think what we can pull out of the pandemic and, and the forced shutdown and the force to use technology is that we in, say, the progressive church um, are better at using apps, we're better at using technology. You know, when I was serving in a church in Boulder uh, and the when the uh, pandemic started, we had, um, I broadcast on Twitch TV. And before I had, I had no idea Twitch TV existed, but it was far easier for people to log on and watch. And so now that we're exiting out of uh, the pandemic and all the restrictions, we have to be able to do both and. And I think we really have the opportunity to, have ourselves imprinted on the internet. How can we use this? You know, we're using radio right now. It's a great medium, but we also have to have other programs, podcasts. We need to have people out there writing op-eds and we need to bring voices together to counter that very negative conservative viewpoint of sexuality and gender identity. I, I love what you said, Reverend Nicole. And one of the things that I've been struck by as I've spoken to faith leaders and particularly Christian faith leaders is that I think a lot of them don't realize that they have a voice in this. And, and I wonder, and I don't know in your experience, but I wonder if there's sort of this discomfort for every reason you just said, because people see these conservative voices imposing on politics and there's this desire not to be that. There's been this sort of step back that I've seen a lot of people take. And I know for me, a lot of my work now has been pushing those people to say, no, you need to speak out. You can't absent yourself from politics because Politics is happening all around us. And if we're not in the conversation, then we relinquish that space. But it's been really hard, I think, for some of my colleagues to feel that they have a voice or to step into that power and not be uncomfortable with it because they're so uncomfortable with seeing other people of faith co-opt those powerful tools. Mm -hmm. And um, my, if I may call you Rory, please call me Nicole. Um, you were, you know, I grew up in, I was born in 59 
So I'm in my early 60s. And one thing that I heard my entire life is two subjects you have to avoid are re religion and politics. Mm -hmm. So what are the what are the subjects that we're having such an incredibly difficult time talking about religion and politics, because we don't know how to talk about them. And coming from the faith world, and as a pastor, I, I live in a 501c3 faith world. So for those of you who don't know, there are different levels of nonprofit organizations. And the 501c3, we're restricted from getting into any type of partisan politics. We can, however, talk on bills and, and ballot measures um, without being becoming partisan. Um, so that's kind of where we've always been set. And and I've frequently been criticized for being too political in my sermons and in my writing. And for me, the rabbi that I follow was extremely political. I mean, he, he challenged um, the ruling authority and he ended up um, dying for it. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit, uh, let's do Rory first with you and then Re uh, Reverend Nicole, is, is a little bit about how you do bring in religion into the conversation about trans, because I think, you know, there there are talking points that we hear from the other side. For people who haven't been able to hear someone from the religious authority talk about this, uh, what are some ways that you feel are important that people hear some messages, some language that people can begin to to learn from? So, uh, uh, Rory, what, what, are, what are ways that you bring in your Judaism into the conversation about trans rights? So there's so many different ways I think that the conversations evolve. Um, for me, I think a big part of where I see the text is in the story of creation in Genesis. And, and I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because I'm not sure if that's where I found it or that's because so many of the Christians that I speak to who are pushed back against it want to cite their sources. So. Um, regardless of that, but right, a lot of the narrative is God doesn't make mistakes. God creates people, and this is how people are supposed to be. And I do believe that God creates people. Also, God gives humanity wisdom, understanding, um, science, so many tools in which we then interact with, dare I even say manipulate, God's creation in the most beautiful of ways. We have tools now to do surgeries when people have disfigurements. We have tools to heal infections. We have cured diseases. All of that to me is just as much of God's creation. And so the idea that we are supposed to use all the tools of God's creation, which includes both our bodies and also every other element of science that makes our lives better. That's what I see in when, when we say in Genesis that everybody is created, but Selim Elohim in the image of God, that image of God is not just what my nose looks like, but that image of God is the full totality of our capacity to participate in creation as partners with God. I love that. I think that's so beautiful. Nicole, what would, what, what would you add to that? Oh, well, I, I totally agree, Rory. In, in the Lutheran tradition, we would say we are co-creators with God. Um, there is nothing that we have, nothing in my house, nothing in my refrigerator didn't come from something on this planet. We have been provided everything we need. And I'm fully, fully, um, I know that if we shared all we had, there would be no hunger in this world. There would be no homelessness in this world. Everyone would have a place to be and have relationships they can be in. But unfortunately, there are people who have made the choice that wealth and material goods are what prove their worth to God. Um, you know, it just galls me that people will quote a few verses out of scripture and say, that's the totality of what God wanted. Um, you know, it makes people really upset when I say, you know, Jesus Christ had no original material. <laughs> Everything came from the Hebrew scriptures. Every word Jesus said, which to me means that Elohim is consistent. We've always been loved. We've all, Each one of us have been made in the image of God. And I've said many times, if you want to see the face of God, look in a mirror. You were made to be who you were be by your creator. 
And for some of us, it takes longer to figure out who we are. I didn't transition until I was 43. Um, and so I have the gift. Sometimes I have a hard thinking about it. it's a gift, but I have a gift of looking at um, life through the eyes of a Latino who was brought up to be hyper-masculine to the point now where I am um, you know, a queer transgender Latina who is very happy, who is very productive. I didn't get, I earned two master's degrees after I transitioned. I became a licensed professional counselor and I became a pastor after I transitioned because I was supported and loved by my family and by my church and by the people who love me. Love and support um, can do amazing things. I just love that. And I think that what is especially galling, I'll say from the outside, you know, I, I feel like I, I want to be with people, but I'm still like, it's not immediate for me in the way it is for both of you. But the idea that some of this is under the guise of parental rights, and yet they want to undermine your parental rights, Rory. I mean, who's mm -hmm. better to talk about your son than you? and your pediatrician and whoever else you bring around you to care for you and yours. Same with you, Nicole. You, you had a community around you. Well, who else is better for, for you to surround yourself? And there's these people who want to come from the outside who in some other situations talk about overreach of government. And here they want to talk about like how government needs to come between you and your child, Rory. You know so much better than I do, but I just think that the inconsistency and the disregard of the experience of people that is at the root of this movement just needs to be called out. It does, and I'm glad you're saying it. And I think it's important as we talk about this that I think that there are individuals who are scared of what they don't understand. This is something that's different for them. It's something that they haven't been exposed to. Look, I don't claim to understand it. As a cisgendered woman who has not felt that I am wrong in my body, I don't know what that feeling feels like. And so I know that that's a hard thing. Now, we also don't legislate laws just because we don't understand something. That's, I think, one of the basic foundations of this country. But I think what's really important to name within this, and I can't emphasize this enough, is that what we're seeing here is a political movement. This is not overarching desire, fear, any of these other words that we wanna put in. And for all the reasons that you just said, Paul, there is a choice that is coming at national levels to make the decision to politicize trans lives as a tool to advance people's political careers. That is what we are seeing here. Oh, underline that sentence. Underline that sentence. As many that times is, as we can. Mm, and, and so mm. this is part of why it's so difficult because Nicole and I can talk about biblical arguments, but that's not actually what people are interested in. And frankly, it's also why the more that my family and I go and sit with people we're not going to be able to stop these bills because what these bills are about are people's political careers. And over four years, we have built relationships with individuals on both sides of the aisle. And I have had so many conversations with people who behind closed doors will say to me, I know these bills are terrible. I understand why these bills are terrible, but I can't be the tiebreaker vote. I can't be the public vote. Um, I will support you behind the scenes. Well, I have to vote yes, but make sure that this person on the other side of the aisle is going to filibuster, do this. Right? There, there are people who are kind of manipulating these things behind the scenes, but feel like they cannot publicly actually say that they support trans individuals or they oppose these bills because they think that it is not politically advantageous. And that is what breaks my heart because people have decided that my family is useful as a political tool. And there are real people. There are real people who are already being hurt by these laws and are going to be hurt so much worse. And making that decision means that people don't care who they are hurting as long as they are advancing power. Pro it's profiles in cowardice. My guests are Reverend Nicole Garcia and Maharat Rory Pickernice. Uh, Nicole, I wonder if you can give us kind of the the national view of this. From your perspective, it feels very coordinated. All of a sudden, we have 400 bills across the country 
that are are being put forward that are aimed at LGBTQ people, specifically often at trans people. What, what, how do you understand this from the national strategy perspective of what we're dealing with? Well, um, first of all, um, I'd like to address, Rory, you are right on, you're spot on. And the reason why they're, they're attacking the trans community right now is because it's effective. And we've seen it throughout history. You know, the, the, uh, the laws in the 1800s that excluded uh, Chinese immigration, the Italians that showed up, the, uh, um, the Irish that showed up, um, you know, the uh, slavery was justified in so many ways through the laws. It works. And unfortunately, right now, we're looking at the fact that, from my perspective, the conservative, since the 1980s, the conservative moral majority has infiltrated uh, a certain political party, and they have played the long game. You look at all these different states, and they have gerrymandered so that state houses are being controlled by the minority. There may be a Democratic majority in certain states, but it's controlled by Republican House and Senate because they have played the long game and been able to push these states farther and farther to the right, even though it's not the majority opinion. And this definitely has been coordinated, mm. definitely coordinated. And they've been, and right now what the Supreme Court is doing is pushing so many of the laws, taking away the federal rights and saying, well, it's a state's rights issue. Why are they doing that? Because they've been manipulating, controlling state houses for 50 years. And this is exactly the game they've been playing in order to keep and maintain control. They've yeah. always had to be at least one other identified in order to focus hate and fury and anger and fundraise off a certain group of people. And, you know, we looked at, it's been very effective very effective and it's 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 classic you demonize a group of people you say like and and it's also you know there's such a you know there's such a gen i mean this is just you know, patriarchy i hate to use that word but this is really just like you know people insisting that there has to be a certain way to be a man and a woman and this is the you know it really if you if you peel off any like the first layer of the onion it's all rooted in this idea of there's one way to be it is heartbreaking. Maybe you can get into some of the specifics right now, Rory, that are going on in Missouri as just one example of what's happening across the country so that we can get a really a sense of like what we're up against in the specific bills and what they're trying to do. For four years now, there's been two kind of primary categories of bills, although um, we can talk a little bit about some of the new bills that are coming up. Uh, Don't Say Gay that we saw pass in Florida that's now appearing in other states that's trying to stop educators from being allowed to talk about gender and sexuality. And um, now a new rise in anti-drag bills and this idea that drag shows are somehow you know, pornographic and corrupting children, right? That's that's the lesson, the, the message of those. But those are newer bills that have been coming up and, and are also passing and are effective. But the two categories that we've seen for a really long time, I'm going to classify one as the, the athlete ban and one as the healthcare ban. I actually find personally, I find the healthcare ban to be in some ways scarier, but the athlete ban to be far more insidious. The healthcare ban aims to say that children under 18 cannot receive gender affirming health care. And the message of that bill is, is saying that children don't have the ability to make these decisions about their bodies, that parents and doctors are somehow manipulating these children and are doing irreversible harm to children. And it's a total corruption of understanding of medicine and science. When we talk about gender affirming care, first and foremost, when we're talking about young children, we're talking about supporting children. Most of the time, when, when my son transitioned at the age of seven, it's really what we would call a social transition. He cut his hair, he started wearing different clothing, he used different pronouns, he changed his name. And so gender affirming health care for him was the doctor calling him by his name and changing his pronouns in the system. And just talking to him about his experience in a supportive and loving way. That was gender affirming healthcare. 
as kids start to get older, we're talking about first and foremost puberty blockers. That is to delay puberty so that exactly what bill sponsors keep saying, we have more time to be making these decisions. So instead of a child going through puberty of the gender that they do not identify, and then needing to have surgery later on in life because now their bodies have changed and need to change again, that delays puberty. So they might not grow quite as tall as when their classmates start to, to shoot up, they might look a little bit younger. So it, instead of suddenly you know, starting puberty at 10 or 11 or 12, you might be delaying it to 15 or 16 you know, later on. And then at some point, those teens are able to go on hormone replacement therapy. And so they would go through puberty of the gender which they are, um, and then basically continue on into their adult lives. The narrative that we hear is, you know, people are doing surgeries on three-year-olds. Nobody is doing surgeries on three-year-olds. And even in a situation where you have a three-year-old who says, actually, I'm a girl, even though you thought I was a boy, all that means is letting that child grow their hair out and then just loving them for who they are. So, so that's the healthcare bill, and that's going to have significant ramifications of putting kids through this, this experience in their body that they keep saying is not the body that they feel right in. And, and this is where we've seen a lot of cases when, when we have gender dysphoria that could sometimes lead to um, self-harm and even suicide ideation. The sports bills, I say, are more insidious in many ways because that those are the ones I found a lot of people have said to me what you said earlier, Paul. Like, okay, so parents are working with their pediatricians, their therapists, their endocrinologists, right? Like, we have a team of people that's been supporting us. Who's the government to decide that they know better for my kids' health care than, than this entire team of people? The sports bills are, um, they're sort of like the bathroom bill 2.0. If you remember when we were debating the bathroom bills, because what the sports bills try to say is it's not fair, right? It's in the name of quote unquote fairness because people have bodies that are different. And so now transgender women have a, a biological advantage over other women when playing sports. Now, again, there's, there's scientific problems with all of this. As women go on estrogen, bodies change. And so we're not really talking about this in the way that um, people want to claim. But the reason why I say it's really insidious is because it creates this narrative that there is a group of women who were men, who were playing sports, who were ranked 20th in their sport, and then suddenly realized, woke up one morning and said, hey, if I become a woman, then instead of ranking 20th, now I can rank third because, you know, I'll be faster than most of the other women are. And so people get really upset because they say, you know, and, and because there's been such a fight for Title IX and women's sports, and so all of these are called Save Women Sports Acts. The number of people who testify, who, who get up and say, today I'm a feminist, I'm finally fighting for women, right? I mean, this is the narrative, but it also subtly says trans individuals are actually not feeling like they are in the wrong body. It's actually just a secret plot to just advance in life, right? This is why I say it was like the bathroom bills because the bathroom bills were basically trying to say to women, and again, it's specifically framing it in this sort of feminist ideology. It said to women, well, you're gonna have men who pretend to be women just so they can go into a woman's restroom and assault you. Trans people are actually sexually deviant. They're actually undermining, they're, they're devious, they're manipulating, right? That this is the experience of trans people and that this is something you can turn on and off to the extent that it just gives you more advantage in life. And then completely dismisses the fact that we are talking about a population that is already severely marginalized, significantly more likely to be harmed and attacked, right? And so it completely flips this narrative on its head. And so it subtly keeps sending this message out into our world that trans people are not people to be loved. They're not people to be cared for. They're not people who we should actually be paying more attention to because society has ignored. Actually, trans people should be mistrusted because all of this is part of some nefarious plot that they have put together. 
That is like that. What you just laid out, I think, is so helpful. Um, both on both levels, uh, you know, the 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 two different areas of the bills, and and this is just beginning. I mean, I feel like you know, I think I think both of you have stated this very well. This is about a quest for power. They do not have your family, either of your families, in mind as they put these forward. They're putting forward a way to gain power for a certain party and a certain ideology. Let me ask you, what gives you both hope right now? Are there areas where you can point to where within this kind of terrible moment for trans lives, uh, you also see hopeful signs? Uh, Reverend Garcia, can you, can you take that? Well, I'm fortunate to live in a little town called Louisville, Colorado, just outside of Boulder. And so, you know, the the Boulder, Denver, Fort Collins area in Colorado has the most people. So we're the largest population. And so our state legislature is Democratic and we have a gay governor who's also Democratic. And so we've made a lot of um, movement towards inclusion within the state of Colorado. Um, a couple, of, well, three weeks ago now, I was at the state capitol um, testifying on a bathroom bill, which we uh, pushed forward. And the bathroom bill was essentially any new government construction, so state, um, county, or municipal, must include a gender, non gendered restroom on each floor. Very straightforward. Also put in uh, changing rooms and, and so forth and so on. But to go to Rory's point, we also, right after that, there was another bill that was being discussed about the trans athlete ban bill. And it was put in by the conservative legislators in the state of Colorado who have to say, well, we're trying, we're trying to protect your families. We're trying to protect your kids. But you know, those liberals are pushing us out of the way, but I'm working for you. A total political gesture on their part, because frankly, there's no way we'll get through the legislature, but they had to introduce the bill because they had to try for their people. And the big, the big issue is, there aren't a lot of trans people out there. You know, we're less than 2% of the population, especially those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s and transitioned in our 40s. You know, many times I've been asked, wouldn't you uh, have wanted to transition when you were much younger? I'm like, I would have loved to transition. I was 13 in 1973, but my family would have massacred me. Because in 1973, the gay and lesbian movement was just really starting to get off the ground. And there was no concept of transgender. There are a few transsexual women running around, but they were, you know, the, they were not looked on with very much positive um, favor in my Roman Catholic Latina family. Mm. So but right now, but now, I mean, the, the fact that in your state, Colorado, um, there were people who stood up and said, yeah, mm -hmm. we actually see transgender people. We want to create um, bathrooms, which is basic needs to meet mm -hmm. the needs of these, uh, these, these constituents, these people, part of our community. Um, and by the way, like, you know, as a, as a dad who had two kids, like the idea that you could only have um, changing, this is a, this is, this is tangential, obviously not the same thing, but the idea that you could only have changing room in women's bathrooms, because for men to have that, you know, is like, you know, crazy, like what man would be changing? Well, you know, when you're two dads, mm -hmm someone's got to change the diaper, you know? And so the idea that like, you know, it is, um, we have, we we're different and we, but everybody should be welcome. And this is like the, and I, so, so Rory, what gives you hope right now? You know, it, if you had asked me this question yesterday, I, I don't know if I would have had an answer. I've been really on an emotional roller coaster this past few months, but I'll tell you what gives me some amount of hope right now. The, the Missouri State Senate is right now debating the health care ban. Um, the Missouri Senate has, I'm pretty sure both houses in Missouri have a supermajority, if not close to a supermajority. Um, th these bills are going to pass in Missouri. They're going to pass and it's just a question of how bad they are. But um, they took up the bill yesterday and um, senators started to filibuster the bill. And, you know, it was, uh, it's just the holiday of, of Purim in the Jewish community, which is when we read the book of Esther and it's sort of, you know, mm -hmm. 
when when hope comes when people think that there's absolutely no hope and there's no power and I, I was having a lot of trouble accessing this holiday, like just feeling totally powerless in this moment. And then I saw this filibuster start and I thought, you know, what better than the story of, of the book of Esther than these small group of senators filibustering when they really have kind of no hope of, of actually stopping the bill. Um, so they're filibustering right now. Um, they're, they're filibustering into today, they're going to continue filibustering the plan. They, the hope is that they're going to go overnight into tomorrow until the weekend. And there is a group of faith leaders that is traveling to Jefferson City, which I just want to say for Missouri, every state is structured differently. But our big urban centers are St. Louis and Kansas City, both of which are two hours away from Jefferson City. And Jefferson City is surrounded by a lot of rural areas. And so we've got faith leaders that are driving to Jefferson City to hold a constant faith vigil in the Senate, a prayer vigil, while the senators filibuster. Um, and these are faith leaders trying to take back that narrative. And so I don't know where we end up um, right now. I know we're going to lose some battles. I believe we're going to win this in the long run. And we are surrounded by love and people who want to make sure that there's a better story than we're telling. And I'm just trying to hold on to that. Mm, God, mm -hmm. I will, you know... We are going to surround you with love uh, and your son and your whole family and and everyone who is, you know, directly impacted. I mean, this is your life. The, people are playing politics with your life. And that's what's so uh, infuriating. It does give me hope that there are faith leaders who are um, available and understand why they need to show up in this moment. For families like yours, like both of yours. Up next, more with Maharat Rory Pickernice and the Reverend Nicole Garcia. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. You can also find links to the topics we discussed this week, extended interviews and transcripts, and an archive of past shows, all at stateofbelief.com. You're listening to State of Belief Radio, where religion and democracy meet. It, there, there is a, a, a concerted effort against trans people. And by the way, to my cisgendered uh, gay brothers out there, if you think you're not part of this, we're part of this. And to all my straight and gay you know, friends out there, this is about all of us. All, it's about human lives and being able to live fully and beautifully as a pastor, as, a, as someone who is, uh, believes in freedom and this country. I want us all to come together around this. And wherever we are in our local community, stand up and be part of the solution. This is part of history, right? Right now, it's the trans community that's on the line. And we are going to keep fighting. And yes, to everything you said, we need everybody to be part of it. And I am confident that while we're losing battles, we're going to win the war. And when that happens, it's every one of our responsibility to see who is the next person, because there will always be somebody else. And so mm -hmm. I think especially as faith leaders, our job is to be looking for who is that marginalized person and never to be part of that marginalization. So I, I hope everybody joins us in this fight. And I hope that we all continue to pay attention because somebody is next after the trans community and we have to be ready to stand with them, too. We also have to recognize it's not just the trans community that are under under the microscope, so to speak. You know, I get calls all the time about immigration. How are we going to solve the immigration issue? And there are trans people in um, countries outside the United States who are persecuted, who have death threats, who can't get to the United States. They're trying to come legally, but you know, our LGBTQ plus siblings in other countries are being persecuted. Um, I stood in front of a, of a, a synagogue um, last Saturday in New York City because a certain group said they were going to do a day of hate. And I had to stand with my, my Jewish siblings um, with my collar on and saying, you know, we all need to be more Jewish. And, you know, we have to stand together. The attack against Roe versus Wade comes down to bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. Controlling women has always been uh, the effort of the patriarchy. And mm. 
if if individuals cannot control their own bodies, have a say over how we treat our bodies, then all of us are doomed. Mm, it's not that's... just being able to determine, um, you know, if it's an, an abortion right, it's whether or not, you know, um, how many cosmetic surgeons surgeons have had to have a woman go through um, a year of therapy before they did a breast augmentation. And I get, and I guarantee you, if they did, they probably find out they weren't doing it for themselves or doing it to save their marriage or to, you know, get land that, that, that husband that they wanted, not for good reasons. Um, they're coming after all of us who live on the margins because that's what they're, that's what they're good at. That's how they kept power and control and been able, been able to manipulate people to believe that if they get what they want, you're going to lose everything you have. Mm. Last question. This is for, again, Maharat Rory. Um, I know you've been involved in the suit the, um, that is being filed on the um, with Americans uniting around um, the separation of church and state and abortion rights. And I wonder if you could just say a few words about that, because there's going to be more opportunities to talk about that, but maybe just a few words about how that happened and, and how you feel these things might be connected. Well, I absolutely. And I think Nicole, you just said it perfectly why all of these things are absolutely connected and, and it's a matter of bodily autonomy, but it's also, again, the manipulation of religious voices trying to claim power through our political systems. So um, Missouri was the very first state after the fall of Roe v. Wade, when the Dobbs decision came down, Missouri was the first state to enact our trigger law and make abortion illegal throughout the state. And um, I am part of a lawsuit with 12 other plaintiffs, all of whom are faith leaders across the state of Missouri from a diverse number of faith traditions who are suing the state of Missouri for an injunction against the law, saying that the law itself violates the separation of church and state, precisely because when the law was, was written, it was written with language saying things such as, life is the purview of the almighty God. And conception begins at birth, which as a Jew, I'm going to say is a profoundly theological statement. It is not a scientific or biological statement. That is a theological statement. And when Missouri wrote religion into our laws, um, we believe that was a violation of the Missouri state constitution that has written very clearly an establishment clause that says that Missouri may not prioritize a religion or impose a religion um, upon anybody. And so we are suing as citizens of Missouri, as taxpayers of Missouri, but all of us are also clergy to say that we do believe firmly in religion. We are all deeply religious individuals, but we also know that as American citizens, none of our faith traditions should ever be codified into our laws. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for all the work that both of you are doing, the witness that both of you have, and 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 bless both of you and your lives. I just feel very honored to have spoken with you, Maharat Rory Pickernese and the Reverend Nicole Garcia. Thank you both for, so much for joining me on State of Belief Radio this week. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with you. A few weeks ago on this show, Public Religion Research Institute President Robbie Jones shared some shocking statistics about just how many Americans support the dangerous Christian nationalist agenda. They might not claim that label, but will endorse a sectarian, faith-driven understanding of what our culture and our nation should look like. To defend a pluralistic democracy for this and future generations will take all of us, and we need to win back as many of the hearts and minds currently in the sway of Christian nationalists as we can. Sarah Levin is founder and principal at Secular Strategies and is co-chair of the Interfaith Council at the Democratic National Committee. Sarah, welcome back to State of Belief Radio. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. 
All right, let's dive in. I think many of our listeners might not be exactly clear what secular means. Is that? I know that's really a starting kind of basic question, but I think it's helpful for people to understand how you view that and how you understand that term. I think it depends on what you're describing. If I'm describing a person or myself, for example, as a secular person, it means that I'm non-religious. When we're talking about the government having a secular character, we're talking about keeping religion and government separate to protect people of all faiths and none and not privileging one particular set of beliefs over another. We're talking about the government being neutral toward religion. Not all secular people are atheists, by the way. Pretty much, I would say all atheists, agnostics, humanists, non-theists are secular, but not everyone who might identify as secular, just not be particularly religious or affiliated with a religious affiliation is necessarily a non-believer. There's a lot of folks in that religiously unaffiliated category who are believers that are unaffiliated with a specific denomination. They might be spiritual, but not religious. They might be right. sort of theistic. They believe in a higher power. That's the God of the, the Torah or, or the Bible. When we conflate those two meanings, And I do think that the Christian right does this on purpose to kind of muddy the waters. They take that identity piece and act as though secularists, secularists are people who are advocating for secular government, right? It has nothing to do with identity. It has to do with that constitutional principle of separation of religion and government. Which, by the way, is you could argue is is a very religious principle. Like, you know, for I'm a Baptist and from my, you know, the separation of church and state is a deeply held original Baptist. Not, a lot of the Baptists don't believe it now, but it was certainly something that Roger Williams, at the, you know, when he was a Baptist and was persecuted for his belief, he was like, we got to separate church and state. Believing in a secular government is not exclusive to secular people. That's actually a much broader coalition of folks. And I know you work in that kind of coalition. How organized would you say the secular people are as like a movement? Is it, it seems like it's growing. It's, it seems like people are beginning to say, okay, I identify that way. And I actually want to show up with that secular title as part of why I'm coming to this conversation. Well, it's certainly growing. Um, but I think, you know, you have to keep the perspective that Religious organizations and institutions have basically had thousands of years <laughs> to get to the, the point where they're at. To be able to organize, you have to first be able to be open and feel safe being open. It's only recent history that there's a significant amount of people who feel, at least in the United States, that can, they can be openly non-religious and, um, and, and not necessarily lose their job or, um, you know, be ostracized by their family. Unfortunately, that's actually still very true for a lot of people in a lot of parts of the United States. It's just that the degree to which that happens is is getting a little bit better because there's just a little bit more acceptance every few years, every time we see that polling. Um, And there's just more, more people um, who are who are coming to that. We have the most secular generation emerging right now among millennials and Gen Z. But that stigma is still very much there and has real consequences for people. How can you organize and advocate for yourself and join interfaith coalitions if we're if you're still in a place where you're trying to destigmatize the identity and be accept and and a lot of people are still hiding it or downplaying it because it's just ha- still has such a high social and economic cost for well, a lot of even people. look at look at like our our, our political leaders I, there's i i don't know of anyone who says i am a secularist i mean there are maybe i'm sure there's a few but it's you know you that's a choice and it puts you at somewhat at risk so i think it, it's a it's a really interesting and so at secular strategies are you like kind of working to overcome those obstacles and invite people into coalition building or tell us a little bit about your work sure and and i do want to make sure i i, I don't give anyone uh, any one of the, uh, your listeners the impression that there's not an organized secular movement there is and it's growing um and so i would say that if you are engaging in any sort of interfaith work do assume that there is some 
local group, some movement in your state or locality that you didn't know about and take the time to look it up, right? Or contact me, right? I'll, I'll help you find those folks, right? There are pretty much in every single state, there's some kind of group in varying degrees. Um, and what the what they're working on and, and what they're, um, you know, who they're comprised of is going to depend very much on the environment that they're living in, right? If you're in a less conservative state where it's really safe to be open, you might have more room to focus on social issues and movement building and that kind of thing. Um, it's just important to understand that in some areas, um, humanist, atheist, you know, secular organizing is, is still kind of in survival mode where they're still just giving people a space to be open, just giving people uh, the ability to not feel alone um, and sometimes providing, you know, support for people who are feeling the real consequences of, of being open. So my work really does center around the people who are in a space to advocate. Um, there's a lot of people doing great work around community building, you know, building those spaces where people can, you know, have coffee, uh, you know, be educated, uh, family oriented services or lots of great organizations that do that kind of work. My job is to help folks uh, find their political voice, build political clout, learn how to join interfaith coalitions um, and really try to mobilize this what I see as a huge potential for a, a powerful voting block of not just non-religious folks and these unaffiliated folks, but our allies in the interfaith movement. Because, you know, this religiously unaffiliated chunk of people, it is it is really diverse. I mentioned earlier, it's it's not just the atheist, the agnostic, the non-theist. It's, it's a huge span of people, um, including some believers. What the group has in common, and it's it's about, you know, it's approaching one in three Americans, somewhere between one in four and one in three, depending on the data you're looking at. When you look at that group's political views, where they land on issues like access to reproductive health care, whether or not businesses should be allowed to discriminate on the basis of religion, public education, how highly they rank the climate crisis as their top issue. I mean, and I could go on. Where, where this group falls on those issues, they are remarkably united, very progressive. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and, and I think that the worldview, when you believe that there's one life and one world, it is extremely motivating to do uh, the best that you can for yourself and others in this one life and to be a good steward of this one planet we have. Mm. Our worldview really does influence our politics. And we end up, of course, coming to the same conclusions that many of our allies, allies of faith do. Um, but there's certain things I've found in my work that are really interesting. For example, overwhelming support in the non-religious community for medical aid in dying, which is the right if you're terminally ill, uh, to end your life on your own terms peacefully, um, which is legal in a few states, but but not not as many as non-religious folks would like to see. That's kind of an extension of the viewpoint on bodily autonomy, because when you take out the um, when you don't have kind of a religious grounding around, you know, God's role versus your role in your life, it, it really uh, falls on the individual, right? I see a lot of folks, non-religious folks involved in animal rights. I don't think that's an accident either. I think mm -hmm. folks who are um, don't see our species as sort of this chosen species that was, you know, uh -huh. gifted this planet, yeah. you know, there's, there's an active, interesting conversation yeah. around speciesism, right. In the, yeah. in the humanist community, but I, you I know, think of the yeah. Peter Singer book, animal liberation, where are some places where people could learn about like some of the, some of the places that you find most provocative and interesting right now to either read a book or a blog or, um, or, or somewhere other way to, to learn more about kind of some of these where secular thought is emanating. If you do want to learn about non-religious people, there's a few sources I do want to plug. Only Sky Media at onlysky.media is a great source for learning about the secular perspective. Some of the content there is explicitly about secular values and how it informs our worldview. And some of it is just journalism and storytelling through a secular lens. So that's a great place uh, to look at kind of the, the secular perspective and learn about it. 
The American Humanist Association has an education center, which is a great resource for learning about humanism and the perspective on all kinds of issues. They also have a lot of statements of principles that they've developed over the years. So you can just go through and see what is the humanist perspective on war, on racial justice and all those kinds of issues. And there's a few um, writers that I, I would highly recommend following. Uh, Chrissy Stroop is one of them. Um, and Kate Cohen uh, has been really great writing for the Washington Post and other bylines. And they, they do a really good job of kind of giving, giving you a perspective on, on different issues. Um, and they're out there um, openly atheist. Um, so that's just a few people to start, but you'll find a lot of people to only Sky Media. Around white Christian nationalism, which is my main focus and, and urgency right now, which is really getting folks understanding this movement and how powerful it is. It is not fringe and it's not new and it is extremely successful, has been extremely su successful um, in taking power. So I think it's really important for people to read about white Christian nationalism, understand it. A few great that, books. That is a, a almost a weekly topic on this show. Uh, so I'm so I, glad I, I, to I, hear that. Come to state of belief for that. But Catherine Stewart uh, yes. and, and all of her work on, on white Christian nationalism is so important. Yes. And then I'm, I'm um, reading right now, Jesus and John Wayne by, I don't know if I'm yes. going to say her name right, Catherine Dumez. Um, Robert, uh, Dr. Robert Jones, who's the head of the Public yeah. Religion Research Institute, yeah. has a few great books on that as well. Absolutely. When they released that poll, which I'm sure was as shocking to you as it was to me, we had Robbie Jones and Amanda Tyler to kind of go through that, all of that important data. And I agree with you. I mean, I think this is existential for our country. And, and it, it will take all of us. Like, you know, I mean, it, it's not, I do think there's a, I, what I love about Amanda's work is that she's specifically saying Christians have a certain role in counteracting this, but it's, Christians are not going to be able to do it alone. We all need to come together. What are some of the strategies that you imagine empowering the secular community to show up and talk about this? So I just did this last weekend a presentation on white Christian nationalism to the Nevada Democratic Party's state central committee. So that's one aspect of my work is really the outreach of talking to people that I think need to know and, and be better prepared to respond to white Christian nationalism. You can't you can't respond to any type of oppression until you understand it. And I have found that there is a lack of education, not just um, among Democrats, but every, most Americans are unfamiliar, as I'm, I know you're part of this work, too. Um, but I'm in the Democratic space because, you know, frankly, um, you know, from my perspective, um, it's it's the Republican Party is is far gone, is it's been taken over by the white evangelical Protestant base that makes up the majority of white Christian nationalists. And so I'm very interested. We have a two-party system. And so I'm very interested in making sure that the party that actually stands for inclusion, actually stands for religious freedom, um, is, is prepared uh, to actually tackle this head on. Because I think by not talking about it, the narrative has been ceded to the Christian yeah. right. Yeah, well, the I mean, even, all even the, there, there, this, this, the history of our country is is seated. They, they're they're rewriting, you know mm -hmm. this, you know they're rewriting January six as we speak. But then they're going back, you know, centuries and rewriting to 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 allow them to claim a mantle of what true Americanism is, and um, and to literally try to erase the history that um, shows the dangers of it. Uh, and, you know, literally in Florida, we're having it be erased. You can't you can't teach history. Um, and I think understanding how they were building power throughout that time period and how we missed it is yeah. really important to actually having a strategy to fighting back. Right. So that's, that's one right. aspect of it. In terms of secular people showing up, I mean, a lot of the work I do is um, really training non-religious people, how to engage, right? How do you talk to your elected officials? How do you build clout? Right. How do you present yourself and in interfaith spaces? And how do you talk about your values in a way that people are going to understand it, be able to, um, to connect with it? 
and, um, you know, just kind of the basics, the basics of how do you talk about this? How do you get involved? And there's there's different ways for people to do that. One of my clients, Jews for Secular Democracy, is going um, at it from a very specifically Jewish lens. That's actually a pluralistic initiative. It's not just for non-religious people, um, but it is bringing that Jewish perspective to church state separation as a religious minority right. um, and calling out, this is something I'm, I'm really um thrilled to be working on is calling out the use of Judeo-Christian, which uh, so many people don't bat an eye or think about it. They think it's inclusive. It's first of all, not inclusive. I mean, obviously, you know, there's more than just Jews and Christians, but also looking at the context of who's using it and, and, and what they are justifying with phrases like that. It's, it's white Christian nationalists who certainly in my view, do not have the interests of any religious minority, including Jews in mind. Um, and so we're starting to do some work to educate the Jewish community about white Christian nationalism, about the role of the Jewish community, how important it is uh, for Jews to be speaking up on these issues and to bring awareness to the use and weaponization of Judeo-Christian to justify their agenda. And then outside of that, you know, last year, I also worked to get a bill introduced that passed the New York legislature. Unfortunately, it was vetoed by the governor. That was disappointing. But the bill would have ensured that anyone who is mandated to attend recovery programs in New York by court, whether, you know, this comes up in a lot of circumstances, maybe you have a DUI, maybe you're looking at the sen- the uh, the uh, conditions of your parole sentencing. Um, making sure that that individual is informed that they have a secular option and provided with a secular option if they choose. Because a lot of people end up in a situation where they are mandated to attend by a court a faith-based program, which works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for everyone, including a lot of people of faith, by the way. You know, you need multiple paths to recovery. We have a massive addiction crisis in our country. We need every tool in our toolbox to address it. This is one aspect that really goes under the radar. And it's not just a justice issue and a public health issue. It's also a constitutional rights issue because we have people who, you know, if you're an individual in that situation, even if you know your rights and a lot of people don't know your rights, they are not in a position to advocate for themselves and say to the judge, say to the to the folks in the room, you know, I'm non-religious or I don't want, you know, it does, it's not going to work for me to have faith be part of this for my recovery. Can I have another option, right? They are not in a good position to advocate for themselves. And so there's those kinds of um, yeah, things that, that I'm working All, all on. of that makes, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's great work. It's ongoing work. And it's The work seems like part of what the future of interfaith has to be and part of what the future of our country will be, uh, considering the trajectory of uh, secular folks, uh, especially young people, which is, as you said, uh, close to a third, um, if not more, of of Gen Z and and, uh, millennials are identify with no religious tradition and Mm. um, but also but at the same time are deeply engaged in the, the, the moral questions of our country, deeply engaged in trying to preserve our democracy. And so the, it doesn't mean they're out of the question of what our future democracy looks like. It's just that they're going to come at it, not from a faith lens, but from a more secular lens um, and other kinds of ways of coming at it through, you know, there's, there's all sorts of ways people are going to be hopefully participating in our democracy if we make space for them, right? If, especially right. if we don't ma- insist our country has any um, identification with Christian white nationalism, which is really, I think, the antithesis of of what we have to be working for now in our country. I am constantly reminding my community that demographics is not destiny. Because some people really believe that, well, because we have the most secular generation, like, oh, they'll just grow up and they'll everything, everything will change. Right. But that's not how power works. That's why we're in a situation now where a minority has disproportionate power. And so if we it's not just going to happen on its own. And so we do need to actively make space for this new generation as young leaders and recognize that the same types of things that we've done to organize and the messaging we've used in the past is not necessarily going to work for a lot of those folks who are secular. And so I just want to emphasize what you said is is really, really important because it's not just going to happen on its own. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, Sarah Levin is the founder and principal at Secular Strategies and a co-chair of the DNC Interfaith Council. 
Sarah, thank you so much for being with us again on State of Belief Radio. Thank you so much for having me. And with that, I'm afraid that's all the time we've got for this week's show. We need your help keeping this show on the air. I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And you can also be part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with friends and family. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part in these conversations, both on and off the air. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the weekly State of Belief podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. And join the conversation. Follow us at Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I cannot wait. Until then, I'm Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch on State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.